Shalom, this is Chris of FirstCenturyChristianity.net. Thanks for taking the time to give a listen. Uh, this is the second message I'm putting out this week because our congregation is not meeting in Kansas City this Shabbat. So there will be no services on uh, July the 8th in Kansas City. Uh, we're going on a field trip to see another congregation a couple of hours away. And so because of that, I'm going to put out two messages in one week. And... Uh, Check your emails. It's good stuff. So this message is called, it started with the word judgment. And it actually started earlier than that. Uh, and I'm talking about a very, a very different style of message because I'm going to teach about prophecy and the resurrection of judgment, what that really means today, by taking a very long journey through, through my walk and my testimony and how I came to be so into studying the scriptures and what first century believers actually believed. And this, it, so it starts a little earlier than that. Uh, my wife and I got married about 24 years ago and neither one of us was, was interested in religion at all. We were just young 20 somethings in Southern California and we lived a secular life. We, we were just having fun living life and uh and even had a secular marriage and so shortly after the marriage we started to feel the pull into church and that's when we learned that we had been raised in very different churches i had been raised as roman catholic and she was a seventh day adventist and when it came time to go to go to church she says what day are we going to go i don't know what, what day are we going to go? It's Sunday. Everybody goes to church on Sunday. And she challenged me to find that Sunday worship, find that Sunday was in the Bible, that we were supposed to do that instead of Saturday, instead of the Saturday Sabbath. And in a long story short, that I will spare you that long story, she at the end of that, she was right. And the first Bible that I read on that journey, which I learned long after the fact, was an a new uh, an NIV New Testament, and at that point in time, I didn't know anything about Bible translations. I didn't know anything about concordances or or lexicons or you know Masoretic text. None of that. I was just a just a young man who uh, had been raised and confirmed in the Catholic Church, and of course that, that's the one true church. I thought I knew everything. Thought, surely I'm going to read these Bibles, read this Bible, whatever Bible I pick up, I'm going to read, and I'm going to find Catholicism, and then we'll be Catholic, and life will be good. And that's not how that worked out. Um, and along this path of me learning that the Sabbath never changed, there along the path, there's litter. There's litter on the side of the road. And that's with me learning a lot of things, many, many things that I had been taught while growing up were just just not true and one of the one of the big ones that i came to while reading is that is that dead people are actually dead and this is something that most of christianity doesn't believe but in the first century it was a very big topic uh was was can the dead live again they did not believe in eternal souls in the New Testament, first century Judea, the, the the people who believed in the Torah, the people who believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they, they believed that when you died, you went into the grave. And some believed that there would be a future resurrection back to life, and some believed not. Some believed that this life was it, and the others believed that there would be a resurrection at some further time. Now, now granted, there are some verses in the Bible that make it look like there, there's eternal life. But when you look at the totality of Scripture and the resurrection of the dead, which is what we're talking about today, that death is the opposite of life. If it doesn't mean that, if death means life in another form, then we kind of have a problem. But that's where the rest of Christianity is. It's kind of a mess because they, they believe that people die and their, and their souls are eternal. And that is very similar um, to the pagan belief of of eternal souls, which which also lines up 
very, very, very nicely with what Satan told Eve in the garden. Surely you will not die. Can you dig it? So, this walk down memory lane is is not exactly about the doctrine of resurrection. It's about the word judgment and the doctrines that surround this word. After I had gotten through the New Testament once and conceded to my wife that the Sabbath had never changed, it couldn't be changed, the commandment was still in effect, the Ten Commandments matter, we joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Well, she just continued. She just kind of became an active Seventh-day Adventist because she was already a Seventh-day Adventist. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church is good, and they are the largest largest uh, sabbath keeping denomination in the world i think there are more seven day adventists keeping the fourth commandment than there are jewish people keeping the fourth commandment in the world uh, they have hospitals they do a lot of good but they are a denomination and they're only going to go so far they're going to live within the constraints of their doctrines which aren't too bad that they're not that bad at all and and i just was not content with the sabbath the state of the dead and eating clean yahweh had more in store for me so the next stop in my walk was with a congregation of really good people who used to be in what's called the worldwide church of god for those who don't know about the worldwide church of god is it was the biggest sabbath and holy day keeping church uh, since the first century. Since, since the first century AD, there hadn't been an organized group of people that I found in history who kept the Sabbath and kept the annual holy days since primitive Christianity. Let's take it out of the first century. I'm sure keeping the holy days, uh, no, I know, in fact, I know keeping the holy days lo- kept going for some Christians on into the 300s. Uh, they continued to observe the days even though they were outside the land. I mean, we could see this plain as day in the first century because Paul says to the Corinthian church, therefore let us keep the feast. I mean, he literally told people to keep the festivals. So the Worldwide Church of God uh, started as an offshoot of what's called the Church of God Seventh Day in the 1920s. And by the 1970s, it was hundreds of thousands of people who were keeping the Torah, even though they didn't call it that. They didn't uh, care to use the, the Greek or Hebrew words. They were a denomination of Christianity, and they, were, they went further than the Seventh-day Adventists, and they were closer to first century Christianity. And when I was with this this small group that broke off of the Worldwide Church of God, that's where I got the idea for this website. Uh, after I started learning and learning and learning, I was like, why do I know this stuff? And I started writing it down. And what you're looking at today is the fourth iteration of this website. It's It's been up for 15 years, maybe, I, I suppose. But the uh, Worldwide Church of God uh, was was not into using Hebrew words and, and their denomination, so they also had barriers. Now the group that I was with did not. They were they were uh, they'd come out of worldwide and they'd come out of the organized religions, and they were uh, kind of unraveling their own beliefs and and trying to figure out what was true and wasn't true uh, when we came and joined with them for for seven years. We were with these guys, and so. The uh, Worldwide Church of God broke up after the death of their leader, Herbert Armstrong, and then they splintered into a bunch of churches of gods of different sizes and different acronyms. Uh, The one I was in was very unique. They had shed or were in the process of shedding most of the errors of the Worldwide Church of God, and they were a lot less of a denomination than Worldwide ever was. So there's a reason I'm giving this testimonial and this personal history recitation, and it's about this word judgment. It's it's deeper than that, though. It's about prophecy and how I entered the world of studying the Bible to ridiculous, ridiculous depths. I mean, to studying to try to disprove what I had just learned over and over and over. So the, the Seventh-day Adventists and the Worldwide Church of God have quite a bit of alignment, remarkable alignment. 
Later on in life, later on after my judgment studies or whatever, I learned that the two groups were very well aligned because Herbert Armstrong was a plagiarist. He liked to rip people off. A lot of the doctrines, the key doctrines of that church, uh, he actually got from other places. He, he pulled off some pretty big cons because they didn't have an internet. And today with the internet, I don't know how a guy like that would, would be able to pull it off, but he did pull doctrines and beliefs into his organization that he kind of made people think were all his ideas, where he was picking them off from other places. But a story for a different day. The alignment of the two groups is they, they are correctly pre-millennium, and they believe in the millennium. They believe dead people are actually dead, and that the future afterlife only comes after the resurrection of the dead. Uh, these are very fundamental beliefs to first century Christianity, and they are a very big attraction to both churches for those who read the Bible. Coming to these conclusions, uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't have to do much to get us to believe these things. The Bible literally talks about a thousand year period where Satan is locked up. That's never happened. That's certainly not now. It's something that's going to happen. When we look at mainstream Christianity and, and, they, and their study of prophecy and looking always looking for the mark of the beast and always looking for the tribulation, and it's like, I, I, you have to wonder, do they ever read the Bible? Because if you, if you just read the book of Revelation, you could see that, that many of the things that mainstream Christians think are going to happen, like now— aren't for now. They're not for a long time. And that, you know, they think that people die and go straight to heaven. And then what do you do with Judgment Day if there is no judgment? It's it's kind of a mess. So, th so, so there's an attraction to Seventh-day Adventists, a worldwide church of God and its offshoots, and all of us Messianic and Hebrew roots groups, uh, all that I've ever heard of, is that, that we all believe that dead people are dead, we're all going to die, except those who are alive when Yeshua returns. And that when we die, we actually sleep in the grave. And when Yeshua returns, we're resurrected, and that begins a thousand-year period called the millennium. And at the end of this thousand-year period, there's another resurrection in which everybody who didn't make it to the first resurrection is brought back to life and judged. So here's the disparity between the Seventh-day Adventists and the Worldwide Church of God, is that the Seventh-day Adventists believe the only people who will be in the kingdom are those who are at the first resurrection, and those are pretty narrowly defined as just Christians. Uh, they believe the thousand-year period is just a type of buffer where Yeshua shows why everybody else is going to be condemned. Then, at the end of the thousand years, everybody who has ever lived and not been a Christian is resurrected, condemned, and then permanently executed. So, executed. They believe the second resurrection is the resurrection of damnation, which is a humongous error. And I'm going to show you in a little bit exactly where that came from. Because that's my study of judgment, and that's when I really started to get into this stuff. Now, the Worldwide Church of God, this is this is the disparity. Seventh-day Adventists believe one resurrection, everybody comes back to life. A thousand years later, everybody comes back to life only to be condemned and thrown in the lake of fire. Okay? The Worldwide Church of God had a very peculiar belief that if it were true, resulted in almost nobody being condemned. Some believed this, some didn't. There's some twists and turns on it. Uh, and a great many people have unlearned this big error. But remember, I'm talking about my own experience here. So if your experience is different, you feel free to let me know. But they had a doctrine which actually had more than two resurrections. It gets pretty confusing because that's contrary to Scripture. And they believed in a second chance, kind of a reincarnation type of thing, where everybody who ever lived would be resurrected to live 100 years and given the opportunity to effectively 
accept the worldwide church of God doctrines and keep the Sabbath and holy days. And if they did that, if they, if during their hundred year second lifetime, they, they accepted Christianity the way it was portrayed by Herbert Armstrong, then they would be able to enter into eternal life. Um, that's pretty audacious. And, and it was never clear to me when the cycle would stop. So if the people got the hundred years, if, if they, if they kept the Sabbath one time, would they just be called up to heaven? Or if they kept the Sabbath 50 times, would they be called up to heaven? It, it was never really clear to me when that cycle would stop. What would happen if somebody who died prematurely? I mean, this goes, the list goes on and on and on, on a practical aspect. But the net effect of that doctrine was you don't have to preach the gospel. They're all going to get it later. So you just live in your little bubble today, and the rest of the world can get the gospel later when Satan's locked up and preached to by their own relatives who had kept the Sabbath during their lifetime. So you could see how very, very painfully bad this doctrine is, and it doesn't line up with the Bible you know, at all. I mean, the idea that you would not want to share the gospel with people is is pretty, pretty bad. I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know what could be worse than that because you're, you are effectively condemning people if you don't share the gospel with them. You're not helping them. So I had never really bought the SDA doctrine. Remember, that's the one where everybody gets destroyed uh, because it didn't make sense. It just didn't make sense that Yahweh, who, who I called God at the time, would bring billions of people back to life only to condemn them to their face and then watch them die. If that was the future, why would you bring them up out of the grave at all? Just leave them there. It just let, let them die and, and be dead with it, and that'll be that. But the net effect of that bad doctrine, though, because if you thought that everybody who who didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah and keep the Sabbath was going to be thrown in the lake of fire, if that was your perspective, then that motivates you to evangelize, it motivates you to try to save your family, it motivates you to actually do stuff. So in the net effect of that bad doctrine is better than the worldwide doctrine. Because I had a very visceral reaction to me. It, it told people that salvation can be put off. That today doesn't matter. It, it, that you're not going to be judged on what you're doing today anyway. In fact, if you took it to its logical conclusion, telling somebody about the Messiah and about the Torah today could condemn them. Because if they didn't accept it, if they didn't accept it today, they were going to be held accountable. If they didn't hear about it today, they weren't going to be held accountable. And that means that Yahweh would have made a mistake with hundreds of millions of people that were born in this lifetime that were never going to get the gospel. So what was did they have like a do-over, like a throwaway lifetime? And I studied this one out to great detail because I knew a great many people who had a very good handle on the Bible who believed it. And because I respected them, I'm like, okay, well, there's, I've got to be missing something here. There's got to be a way this is true. If, if, if these guys who are my mentors and they're nice to me and they believe this, then I have to be missing something. And it was this study where I learned an incredible amount about the Bible, how it's written, how to study and Let's go right now with where the Seventh-day Adventists got their idea that the resurrection, uh, the second resurrection, is, is, is just a very cruel thing. And they got this from the King James Bible. In the King James Bible, and John, I'm going to read this to you, John 5, 27 to 29. This is not true, and we will be correcting this in the next slides. But I'm going to read it. It says that hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. 
Okay. So there you have it. Two resurrections, one to life, and one to eternal fire. Do you know what this proves right here? This proves that Ellen White was a false prophet who was completely reliant on a faulty translation called the 1611 Authorized Version of the Church of England, commonly referred to as the KJV. This is the verse where I learned the KJV is absolutely an inspired version. It's inspired by the King of England. <laughs> it's not inspired by Yahweh. You see, I had downloaded a program called eSword, which is free Bible software. It's still available today. I'm still using it today. That's where this came from. And um, and this this free product that's put out by, by a wonderful individual who's made it possible for the entire world to study the scripture at a level previously unthought of with every type of translation, concordance, lexicon, maps, everything is available, almost all of it for free. And when you download it, you get the King James Version, and then you get the KJV Plus. And the little plus sign means that it will tell you the Greek or Hebrew word behind most of the words of the Bible. And it's called the Strong's, the Strong's Numbers. And we, when you get this software, you can just hover your little mouse over the word, over the number by the word, and it'll tell you what number is behind there. And when I did that, for this verse, I learned that the same exact Greek word is used for the word judgment in verse 27. That's also used for the word damnation in verse 29. On this screen right now, where it says, execute judgment to the resurrection of damnation. That word damnation and that word judgment are the same word. They're not different. I learned that when the Messiah spoke in John chapter 5, he said the same word several different times that the Church of England translators decided to represent differently because they were they were not translating the bible they were putting forth doctrine and the form of a translation can you imagine this can you imagine james 3 verse 1 says be not many teachers for we will receive the greater condemnation or judgment Meaning that people who are just teachers, like me, are going to be judged harsher than those who, who have different callings. Imagine if you're a scribe, and you're actually misrepresenting what the Bible actually says. Why did they do this? Because this is blasphemy. They did this because the King James Version is an English translation of Church of England doctrine. The translators were under instruction from Parliament and the king to not translate it literally. They were to specifically not translate words like ecclesia, which means congregation, which is similar to synagogue, which is similar to kahal in Hebrew. They were not because the church is supposed to be a group of believers. But the Church of England is a top-down organization where you have to do what the vicar tells you what to do. And the rules, there were 15 rules of translation for the King James Bible. And you can search those uh, on the Internet. And, and I would, I'm really encouraging you to do that, especially if you're, uh, if you're a KJV person, because it's going to open your eyes big time. And so now... We're going to take a look at what these verses really say here. And here is a picture of the King James. And I'm just proving it to you so that you don't have to go and, and do a lot of work. But you should download eSword. You should be using these tools to study on your own. But you can see in verse 27 where it says judgment, G2920. And I've got the definition there of crisis. 
And then you can see in verse 29 where it says damnation is actually the same exact word. It's, it's not different. This is the blasphemy I speak of. And you can see for yourself that the translators decided to misrepresent what the Messiah said. And, and this falls into, you know, in the book of Revelation, it chides a, a church for not for falling away from its first love. This was my first love. When I found out the Bible was purposely made wrong, I was motivated to tell everybody. And that's when I learned how dearly people regard the King James Bible. Because growing up Catholic, I had no idea. I had no I thought Bibles were Bibles. I have no I no idea. I read an NIV New Testament. I read a new King James cover to cover. I then came across a Bible teacher uh, in the in the Church of God Splinter group I was in who was just a wonderful, eloquent, remarkably gifted teacher who was using this translation called the NASB. And I said, I want to be that guy. And I adopted the NASB at that point and then learned why he was using that. It's very accurate, very literal, and, and very up to date with the latest findings of Dead Sea Scrolls and whatnot. Um, but boy, was I motivated. And this um, Worldwide Church of God doctrine, well, first, the Seventh-day Adventist belief in the final judgment being a damnation is wrong. That's not true. It's not a damnation. In fact, the word damnation doesn't even belong in the Bible. It's a period of judgment. And when I learned this, it really fired me up. And then the Church of God doctrine. Well, this is when I used my newfound software to study the word judgment in great detail. In fact, I, I paid 20 bucks and got the NASB, which you can see the little tabs on the screen. Uh, but this is, you know, 15, maybe going on 20 years ago, because so many people believed in this second chance thing that that in order for it to be true, the word judgment would have to mean something different than a decision. that Because that's what the word judgment actually means. If you have to make judgments in your own life, what time am I going to get up or where am I going to work? And if you go in front of a, a judge, he renders a judgment, and that's either guilty or not guilty. These are decisions that can go either way. And so I, I studied in depth because I did so many people that were that really knew the Bible, that were really helping me and really being nice to me, believed in this, this really strange doctrine that this lifetime doesn't even matter. So I scoured, and, I, and the only time I could find is, is that, you know, if, if second chance or if judgment meant a period of education, right? And the only thing that even came close was when Moses was in the wilderness judging everybody, but he was still judging people on things they had just done. He was judging them, showing them the error of their ways, and sending them on their way, right? But that was that was the closest I could find to judgment, meaning something about a correction. But even then, you can't take what Moses was doing and apply it to the eternity type stuff to a large degree, right? To a small degree, you can. Because when Yeshua comes back, even at the first resurrection, he's going to, we're, we're going to, you know, when he comes back, if we're still alive or if we're resurrected, we're going to have to get correct. There's, we're, we don't know it all. Even those of us who've studied the languages, I mean, there's some people out there who are incredibly gifted. We're, we're all going to have to get a correction when the Messiah comes back, right? And there, but those are, but I'm not talking about another hundred year lifetime. I'm talking about people who are going to be saved to, to eternal life, having to learn accurately the ways of Yahweh and his son. There, there's no second chance in, in this Bible with respect to salvation. It just isn't there. And, and the word crisis means decision time. And it's a type of judgment that could be for or against people. So what happened? 
what happened when I studied these two disparate doctrines is that I came up with something. Well, I didn't come up with it, just reading it. And the Bible actually tells you about the resurrection of judgment, because that's what it is. It's not a resurrection of damnation, and it's not a resurrection of rehabilitation. It's a resurrection of judgment. And here it is in Revelation 20, uh, 11 through 15. The Bible tells you exactly what it is. And then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne. And books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead and the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire and so this is this is if you read all of revelation 20 right i just brought in the second resurrection part you'll see revelation 20 talks about the first resurrection then a thousand years and then this happens and i've switched from the uh, kjv to the nasb because i want to actually accurately <laughs> represent the scriptures to us all and in these words these verses the word for judged is crino which also means to decide one way or another. The result of my exhausted study of the worldwide church of God, God doctrine is also uh, that it's wrong, and Herbert Armstrong is also a false prophet. He and Ellen White, well, when they get resurrected, they're going to... At any rate, they're false prophets. And the judgment at the end of the thousand years is a decision based on the lives of that people have already lived it's everywhere i looked and talking about this resurrection of judgment end times judgment it's always based upon things that people have already done not things they're gonna do and at, it's plain as day right here where both of these churches are incorrect because people at this resurrection their names are already written in the book of life. Some of these people are raised and judged favorably. Some of these people are raised and judged unfavorably. So they're not all thrown in the lake of fire, and they're not all given another chance at life. These verses specifically say that there will be people at this resurrection whose names are found already written in the book of life. Now, don't ask me how they got there. That's the next thing that happens. Well, Chris, what about Chris? What about this? What about that? You know, what if they were repenting on their deathbed, or what if they never heard about Yeshua? I don't know. I don't know what the criteria is for for them to be saved. I barely know what the criteria is for me to be saved. Okay, there's a lot of I don't know in the Bible, but I do know what this says. After spending an inordinate amount of time learning it and i'm not going to be one of these people who are joining the pile of false prophets that speak uh presumptuously so to speak and that list just keeps getting bigger and bigger every day i'm a guy who studies the bible and writes articles sometimes i write articles good well <laughs> and uh, i give speeches and that's it so Today's message had two purposes. One was to teach about the resurrection of judgment and what it really means. And the other is to show how the Ruach motivated me to learn. Because the Bible is incredibly important information. And some of it is more important than others. The information about obtaining eternal life. Can you imagine misrepresenting the word of god on purpose that is terrible can you imagine going through life and not preaching the gospel because you think your neighbor's going to get it later these are these are big big problems and i know that as as time's gone on 
and you develop all these skills, uh, the, the ability to look these things up leads you to wanting to learn foreign languages and learn different translations and obtain different, you know, philosophy books and history books. But let's not lose sight of our first love and what's actually important. That, that for God to love the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever shall believe in him will have eternal life. The next line talks about what? Yahweh did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that whoever believed in him might have eternal life. To, the way to escape this judgment is to accept Yeshua as the Messiah, repent of your sins, be baptized, and join the family of God. Today, that's how you get saved. And then the next day, you learn. And the next day, you learn. You get on this path, you get on this journey, you start learning the Bible, you start keeping the commandments, and then you enter into life. Because the alternative is pretty risky. And I don't think we want people to be there, because I, so, I know I certainly know. So thank you so much, and I hope this message motivates you to study and to prove all things and hold fast to the truth. Thank you so much for listening. Please drop by firstcenturychristianity.net and uh, may you have a blessed week. Boker Tov. Have a good Shabbat. And remember, we will not be there on July the 8th, 2023. And, but I will see you the following week. Shalom, everybody. Bye-bye.